Hi there, my name is Dr. Teresa Cooney and I am a comprehensive ophthalmologist and cornea uh, specialist at the Kellogg Eye Center and today I'm going to be talking to you about capsular tension rings. So just as an introduction, capsular tension rings are made of PMMA, a plastic material with a circular open loop ring. These are meant to stabilize the zonular apparatus through centrifugal forces. Once they are inserted into the eye, into the capsular bag, they can expand and centrate that capsular bag, supporting weak zonules and recruiting tension from stronger zonules. This in turn will provide intraoperative support for both preoperative or intraoperative zonular defects, and it can also provide long-term postoperative intraocular lens fixation. It's also thought to potentially lead to less and more symmetric capsular mimosis or contraction. So looking back at the history of these rings, Back in 1999, Hera et al. published a article where they discussed a closed silicone ring, but this ring did not adapt to various bag sizes. In 1993, Legler et al. published an article where they talked about the first capsular tension ring that was designed for humans specifically. This was an open PMMA ring with eyelets on both ends, and this has since been marketed by Morcher, and we'll be talking more about that later. In 1994, Nagamoto and Bison, Mayajima, implanted an open 12.5 millimeter PMMA ring into a cadaver eye. In 1998, Sioni and his co-workers started using the modified capsular tension ring, which we will discuss later. And in 2002, Dr. Ahmad used a capsular tension segment for the first time. So what are indications for capsular tension rings? The most common indications are for zonular issues. These issues most commonly include pseudoexfoliation, traumatic zonular lysis, iatrogenic zonular damage, often incurred during the surgery, Marfan syndrome, homocystinuria, hypermature cataracts, high myopia, and post vitrectomy and or filtration surgery eyes. It can also be used if there was significant contralateral postoperative capsular phimosis to prevent it in the eye that you're operating on. Less common indications include iris defects from things such as aniridia, intraocular neoplasms that have been excised, leaving some large defects, as well as congenital lens colobomas. Other indications that are less common include retinitis pigmentosa, wheel marchesani syndrome, and microspheres fakia. So what are the criteria for implanting capsular tension rings? First of all, it would be mild zonular instability as opposed to moderate or severe zonular instability. What this means is that you could have less than, not more than, four clock hours of zonular lysis, or mild generalized zonular weakness, and how this can be ascertained is whether there is some mild phacodinesis or shaking of the lens when you examine the eye, slight lens movement during the anterior capsular rexus creation, or mild anterior capsular rexus ovalization during creation of the capsular rexus. So a person who would have good indications for capsular tension ring placement would be someone with pseudoexfoliation with a mild floppy capsular bag. Contraindications would be, like I said, moderate or more advanced zonulopathy, so having more than four clock hours of zonular problems and having a capsular bag that anteriorly radializes or posteriorly tears, so you need to have an intact capsule, because what can happen is the capsular tension ring can provide further extension or breakage of the capsular bag. So there are two major design types of the capsular tension rings on the market currently. The first one is the one that I've highlighted up here. It's the Morcher ring, also called the Reform ring, and it is manufactured by Alcon. It has three different sizes or types. The first one is a type 14, this is 12.3 millimeters and can compress to 10 millimeters. And it's basically meant for eyes that have axial lengths less than 24 millimeters. The most common Morcher ring is the type 14C Morcher ring. It is 13 millimeters. It compresses to 11 millimeters. And it basically is meant for axial lengths of 24 to 28 millimeters, which is a majority of the eyes that we operate on. The third type is a type 14A Morcher ring. This is 14 and a half millimeters. It compresses to 12 millimeters. And this is a more rigid design for myopic eyes that have an axial length of greater than 28 millimeters, so not used all that frequently. The second design, which has come out more recently, is the design that I have up here, which is the Henderson ring. This is also made by Morcher, and it comes in a single size, a 12.29 ring that compresses to 11 millimeters. So pretty similar to the type 14C Morcher ring that I have listed above. What they claim is that it has enhanced flexibility and breakage resistance, and that these eight equally spaced indentations that you see along the edge of the ring here allow for easier nuclear and cortical material, which can sometimes be difficult when you have to insert a ring at the beginning of a case. Another ring is the Optic ring. This is made by Stabilizer AMO, 
And this is a 12 millimeter ring that compresses to 10 millimeters. And they also have a 13 millimeter ring that compresses to 11 millimeters. But these don't tend to be used as frequently as the Mortar rings. So the device size, how do you decide what is the best ring to put into a person's eye? This is basically often based on capsular bag dimensions. Basically, you want a larger ring for a larger capsular bag. The capsular bag typically positively correlates with both the corneal diameter. So what you want to do is measure the white to white diameter, and then that would basically approximate the compressible diameter of the CTR. And you also want to look at the axial length. You usually are going to need a larger capsular ring size in more highly myopic eyes, as I described earlier. It's most effective to have the ring ends to overlap when you're done, so the diameter should exceed that of the capsular bag. Many surgeons prefer a larger implant, so the most common ring, like I told you before, is a 13 millimeter ring that compresses to 11 millimeters, because if the ends do not overlap, the gap should be opposite the area of zonular dehiscence. So when is the best time to insert a capsular tension ring? It really can be inserted any time during the case. It can be inserted into the capsular bag, however best, after a good hydrodissection. If you have to insert it before phacoemulsification, the pros would be that you'd have improved nuclear stability for phacoemulsification during the procedure. So this is helpful for patients with pseudoexfoliation or who have known preoperative zonular issues. However, the cons would be that it's more difficult with a mature lens to have this capsular tension ring and to remove the nucleus, and you can have higher risk of further iatrogenic damage during the case. There's also increased difficulty removing cortical material during the case, and if a capsular tear were to occur, there is a risk that the ring could move posteriorly into the vitreous and then would have to be retrieved later. You can also decide to do it after phacoemulsification. However, if you think you might need it earlier in the case during phacoemulsification or cortex removal, there's also an option of putting iris hooks to support the capsular bag to give you additional support during the surgery. However, there is risk that the iris hooks could become dislodged and that you could subsequently get some additional capsular tears. But the optimal timing of the insertion is to do it as late as is safely possible and do it, do it any time there's loss of zonular integrity. So what is the technique? Initially, they used to insert these with the two-handed technique using forceps. Tying forceps were used to inject the capsular tension ring through the wound, and a second instrument was used to help direct the insertion. And I will now show you a video that will uh, describe to you the more common technique currently, which is the injector technique. So basically, the video just showed you a depiction of what the actual technique is, but now I'll verbally tell you about it. So there's an injector called a goiter injector, and it's a one-hand technique. Basically, viscoelastic is used to lubricate the ring when it's placed on the surface of its container. The injector hook is then used to engage an eyelet at the trailing end of the ring, then used to withdraw the ring inside the injector. The injector is then placed through the temporal clear corneal incision or the scleral incision, whichever you used, and is aimed into the capsular bag after viscoelastic has been placed into the capsular bag if safe. The ring is released slowly under the anterior capsular ring, and the leading edge should be directed against the quadrant of zonular issues so that the implantation is to proceed clockwise. The reason for this is you want to push loose equatorial portions of the capsular bag against the sulcus during the ring introduction, preventing further zonular damage and preventing herniation of the vitreous into this area. Once the entire ring is secured inside the capsular bag, the injector is then rotated 90 degrees clockwise and then posteriorly to disengage the eyelet of the trailing edge of the ring and then remove from the eye. A few pearls for insertion of these capsular tension rings. It's very important to have a good but gentle hydrodissection. If you inject for your hydrodissection too vigorously, you could have further issues in terms of further zonular damage as well as causing additional issues with the capsular bag. And you, this can be done with either balanced salt solution or a viscoelastic. You want a circular, complete curvilinear in a capsular rexus, and you want to aim for one that is a 5 to 5.5 millimeter size. Again, if there's any defects in the capsular bag, whether they be posterior defects or anterior realizations of your capsular rexus, it is not safe to use a traditional capsular tension ring. You want to use low settings on your phaco machine, so low vacuum, low aspiration, and low irrigation to try to prevent further disruption of the weak zonules. Chopping is probably one of the better ways to do these cases, and this avoids excessive zonular stress as well as the excessive spinning sometimes required with some other techniques. But however, I would recommend that you avoid peripheral chopping initially. And finally, you want slow irrigation aspiration. You want to strip tangentially towards the area of zonular dehiscence. Complications that can ensue. 
intraoperatively. Again, you can create further zonular damage and then you have to reassess the situation at that time. As I mentioned also, the capsular retention ring can become dislocated and if there's insufficient support in the capsular bag or by the zonules, the capsular retention ring can actually fall into the back of the eye. One way to prevent this from happening is to place a tenoproline safety suture through the leading eyelet so that it can be retrieved more readily. Postoperative complications can include subluxation or dislocation of the capsular retention ring at any time. And this is a bigger risk when there's more severe and more progressive zonular lysis. So again, it's very important to decide during the case how much zonular damage there is. You can also get posterior capsule opacification from these, but it's actually thought that there might be less opacification that occurs when using a capsular retention ring. And finally, some patients are prone to capsular phimosis or contraction, and there may also be reduced incidence of this compared to when you don't use a capsular retention ring. A few other options. There is something called a modified capsular retention ring, which was introduced by Sioni, as I discussed earlier. Basically, this has one to two fixation eyelets, as you can see over here on the side of the ring, that you can fixate anterior to the capsulotomy. And these fixation eyelets are then secured to the sclera and provide additional support to the capsular retention ring. So this allows scleral suture fixation of the capsular bag, but you must have an intact anterior capsular rexus and a posterior capsule, again, to be using these. There's also something called a capsular retention segment, and that was introduced by Dr. Ahmed, as I mentioned earlier. And for these types of segments, you may have disruption of your capsule, and this is used for maximal interoperative support with scleral fixation. You can place more than one of these as needed. Basically, this chart at the end here compares the different types of capsular retention segments and rings that are available and tells you what the pros and cons are to both of them. So basically, a continuous curvilinear capsular rexus is required for a capsular retention ring and a modified capsular retention ring, but not for a capsular retention segment. It's difficult to place a capsular retention ring and a modified capsular retention ring prior to lens removal, but possible, and it's easier to place a capsular retention segment just because they're smaller. The only ones that can be used with anterior capsular tears and posterior capsular runs are the capsular retention segments. The capsular retention ring can be used with less than four clock hours of zonular dialysis, whereas the capsular retention segment and modified capsular retention ring can be used for greater than four clock hours. Again, similarly, for those cases that have progressive zonular lysis, a capsular retention ring should not be used, but a modified capsular retention ring and capsular retention segment can be used. These latter two devices can also be used to scleral fixate to the sclera. One of the things, both the capsular retention ring and modified capsular retention ring are pretty easy to remove from the eye if necessary, whereas the capsular retention segment is not as easy to remove. And finally, the capsular retention ring and modified capsular retention ring make cortical removal a little bit difficult because of the bulkiness of them, whereas the capsular retention segment is less bulky and it's therefore easier to remove cortical material. And this is just some of the references that I use for this presentation.